Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The Social Innovation Speaker Series um, is, is sponsored by our own newly formed Center for Social Innovation, the Bertha Center for Social Innovation here at the GSB, um, which is a really exciting initiative. Uh, the director of the center is Francois Benici, who is assiduously writing down, but stand up just so people can see who you are. Maybe if you want to talk to Francois after, uh, after the, the talk, I'm sure you'd be delighted. And uh, the center is quite an ambitious, uh, bold initiative, I think, uh, here at the GSB to, through scholarship, teaching, engaging public dialogue, and creating the kinds of partnerships that will actually spark action to essentially practically reimagine the world. Small initiative. I mean, what can we do to make, make the world a more humane place, a more ecologically resilient place, a more just place, a more creative place? And when I say practical, I, I think that's the key part for us. How can we, uh, what can we do in our own real context, in our own countries, in our own communities, in our own organizations, government, business and the social sector um, to, to really respond to the, not just the problems that we, we all know about, but the kinds of possibilities, the kinds of hopeful possibilities that we um, have in front of us. And so the center will be trying to spark that dialogue um, over the next uh, several years, and we hope that this speaker series will be a, a big part of that. Um, and will challenge us not only to rethink what we're doing, but to, to, to take some kind of action in our, in our own ways. So as Cherry said, uh, it's hard to imagine anybody more appropriate to kick off the, the speaker series for us than Henry Metzberg. Um, I could introduce him for a long time. Um, I'm going to introduce him for a medium long time uh, to give you a sense of the, the kind of daunting scope of his, his thinking and his career um, and hopefully get you salivating waiting to hear what he has to say this time. Um, Henry, I, I think, has been responsible for at least four kind of major shifts in management and organizational thinking, quite possibly more. The first uh, really sprang from his, his early doctoral work, his doctoral uh, research, where he asked the kind of superficially naive question, what do managers actually do? Because it turned out nobody had really thought so hard about that. There were lots of kinds of abstractions that had words like planning and controlling, etc. but that we didn't know what the flesh on those bones meant. So Henry actually went out with a stopwatch in hand and chased managers around, followed them, took notes, and created a piece of work that has been in print for 40 years, the book that came out of that, that is taught in business schools all around the world. Um, and that was just his first sort of foray. He then uh, did a number of things, including looking at the same kind of question about the structuring of organizations. How do we really structure them? How do they make decisions? Not just what we say in terms of these organograms, but what, what do they really look like? And came up with a much richer, um, uh, you know, more complex typology of how organizations really function structurally. The third thing, was, which is probably what he's best known for, was taking that same kind of question to strategy itself. How do organizations make strategy? How do they decide what to do? And at the time, um, the, the, the conversation around strategy was largely about planning by special people, leaders, and special planners, and then the execution of those plans was very much about cerebral analytical design. Henry went out and looked at real organizations in the real world and said, how, how are they actually creating these strategies? And found Sure, sometimes they plan and execute, but very often there's a, there are many other ways that strategies come about. Um, he talked about those and particularly was um, seminal in introducing the concept of emergent strategy and saying that sometimes these patterns come together out of many small interactions 
among the company and that's only later we realized that there was a pattern in the first place. Um, so this opened up a, a realm of thinking and it helps management and organization scholars connect to the emerging world of complexity thinking and self-organizing systems. So that's his third one and that was you know, 20, 30 years ago. So he, he was on a roll. I think the next uh, piece that was really quite powerful that he talked to the faculty about yesterday had to do with management and education itself. And he's been working over the last, I guess, close to 15 years now to develop alternative approaches to management education that are really grounded in practice, where managers are practicing while they're studying, where they have significant experience, where they're reflecting and consulting with each other. Um, and then this fifth piece that he's going to talk about tonight is taking his exploration farther into kind of the social and political world. The thread running through all of those for me, and I think this best exemplifies what Henry's all about, is being very wary of kind of bloodless abstractions and wanting to know what are the rich ways that people actually act in the world. And then from that place we can actually create change um, more than we can from our, our, our you know, abstractions. And so he's always gone out and dug himself into things with a kind of preternatural, uh, kind of amazingly energetic curiosity which still astonishes me. I went uh, with Dulcie, Henry's partner, Henry, up uh, to uh, Table Mountain a couple days ago. And Dulcie and I were ambling along at a pretty, you know, leisurely pace, and we still were stopping every, every two minutes to wait for Henry, who had disappeared because he was off looking at some crazy rock that he decided was the most fascinating thing in the universe, or taking a picture of a flower, or just or reading, you know, the kind of the signs that nobody ever reads, and just really engaging with Table Mountain, like it was the most amazing empirical study of his, you know, his great career. And every time I've hung around with Henry, it's been the same kind of engagement. Um, and so this piece that he's going to talk about tonight, you might wonder, how do you actually, if, if, you're, if your topic is the whole world of politics and society and the planet, how do you do that same kind of, how do you empirically go out and study that? You know, you can't just follow a couple people around with a stopwatch. Um, and it's quite interesting how this has actually happened. About 10 years ago when I met Henry, I was getting ready to come study uh, for my doctorate at McGill uh, under his supervision, and he sent me an email with a, a paper, a piece of a pamphlet attached to it, and he said, this is a thing I've been working on called Beyond Smith and Marx. Um, I think I'm going to publish it as a pamphlet uh, in maybe two or three months. So take a look at it, see what you think. So I read it, quite interesting, gave him some comments, and didn't hear much more about it. And it seemed like every year or 18 months, Henry would bring it up again and say, I think I'm about ready to publish this thing. Um, take a look, what do you think? During, during those intervening uh, times, I, I, Henry would go traveling, and he would come back and he'd always say, you know, I had the greatest conversation around the Smith and Marx piece that he was calling it. Um, and he'd, he'd, I, mean, you know, I, was in, I was in Senegal doing this, I was in Italy, and I was, he was literally going all over the world talking to people about this work that he was doing. And I said at one point, do you do this with all of your papers and books, Henry? And he laughed and said, no. But literally he spent you know, a good 10 plus years taking the kinds of questions and themes that he's gonna talk about tonight. And since he can't, create enough of his own experience to bring all of these kinds of issues together, he's been bringing in everybody else's experience wherever he could. So this is literally the result of, of hundreds of conversations around the world um, and kind of trying to distill those. So, there, so in one way, what Henry will talk about is in his own unique, entertaining voice, uh, provocative voice, but in another way, it, it represents the voices of an enormous number of people around the world. Um, and this process is continuing. This is the first time Henry's been in South Africa. Um, and so I think that you know, the context here offers a, a really rich source of inspiration and, and continued insight for, for what he's working on. So the question and answer period and afterwards, uh, you know, I encourage you to really share, particularly from uh, our frame here, what's been happening and how it might feed into this, because that's how he's done this. So, uh, so it's really uh, beyond a pleasure to be able to welcome him here tonight. It's a real privilege uh, to be able to hear this culmination of some of his thinking over the last many years. Um, and, with, and with that, I'll leave it to Henry, so Professor Henry Metzberg. Thank you, Randy. I'm coming from the far right, um, so <laughs> now, now I'm coming from the far left. Um, does anybody know why I put this up? Does anybody notice anything about this? Look at the bottom. Two for the price of one. Marx must be spinning in his grave. This is, this is Smith uh, kind of being pasted on top of Marx. Um, Poor Marx's manifesto is now being sold two for the price of one. I don't know if you appreciate the irony. But, uh, um, I am going to talk about a world in which uh, 
we've been dominated by these two extremes. Um, not all of us, um, but the Eastern Europeans were dominated by one extreme, and that collapsed uh, in uh, 1989. Um, and in the West, uh, particularly in the US, but most places in the West, we had a ready answer for what happened. Uh, capitalism had triumphed. That was the, um, that was the uh, solution. Um, so capitalism had triumphed and communism had failed. Um, and because we believe that, we've been collapsing, or not collapsing, but heading for collapse ever since. That's my basic thesis. Capitalism did not triumph in 1989. Balance triumphed in 1989. The, the communist uh, countries of Eastern Europe were utterly out of balance on the side of the public sector. The private sector uh, was terribly weak in Eastern Europe, and the what I prefer to call the plural sector, uh, or you can call it civil society or NGOs or not-for-profits or whatever, but the, the part of society that's not business and not government uh, was quite strong in 1989. It was very weak in, uh, in the communist countries. Um, uh, there were, the, in fact, the crack in the communist country, the first crack, really, you could argue, came in Poland. Uh, and it came as a result of two one plural sector organization that survived in Poland under communism, and that was the Catholic Church, uh, that had maintained a reasonably strong position, unlike most of the other communist countries. Um, and that, you could argue, gave an opening to solidarity, uh, the union that eventually pushed the change in Poland. Um, so the communists had good reason to fear the plural sector um, because it interferes with their, their uh, authority their power, um, and that's what's, uh, uh, um, uh, what's, what's happening today in China, basically. The Chinese government is worried about the plural sector. So, so uh, uh, although the public sector is very strong in China, and the private sector is quite strong in China, the plural <coughs> sector is extre extremely weak in, uh, in China. So, so the belief that capitalism triumphed uh, has caused us to go out of balance completely the other side. Um, and we're going more and more out of balance in, in favor of all the things on the right or all the things uh, in, the, uh, in the private sector. And uh, to the extent that I think we're facing a very great situation. There's an article I read by a uh, lawyer in Toronto who argues that the conditions in the United States today, with unions being so weak, with executive bonuses going out of control, with corporations having so much influence in the political process, he makes the case with a lot of evidence um, that this matched exactly what was going on in both uh, Germany and Italy in, in the 30s. Uh, that those were the conditions, the very conditions that are existing in the United States were the conditions uh, that gave rise to uh, fascism in, um, in Germany and Italy. So we're not talking about some casual we're talking about some major forces, I think, um, and, and my perception is uh, we're racing out of balance at an accelerating rate. Um, to give you an example, I, I, I find it interesting that in, um, in the Americas, in, in the US and Western Europe, uh, people are inclined to point a finger at Africa, particularly Central Africa, and so on, and talk about the political corruption, uh, corruption in the political process. The difference in the United States today is that the corruption is legal. Uh, the U.S. is no, U.S. politics, to my mind, is no less corrupt. It's just legal corrupt. Donations, uh, the role of money in politics and everything else is legal in the United States today. Um, and in Africa, what they do is, uh, not so bad, but parts of Africa, at least, <laughs> uh, what's done is illegal. Why do you maintain it? you maintain that? In fact, if you, I guess people rate democracies, and it would be interesting to see. I, I, my view is that the, we tend to talk about democratic states and non-democratic states. I, I think that's completely wrong. I think we should talk about relatively more and less democratic states. Democracy is not a state. Democracy is not a given condition. Democracy is a set of characteristics, like a free press, like open elections, etc., etc. Um, and countries are more or less democratic than other countries on 
some of those dimensions. So one country will have a freer press, then another country, one another country will have more open elections, then another country will have less influence of money, and so on and so forth. You can rank democracy by, uh, on a relative scale on all these different dimensions. You can also rate democracy according to where that same country was previously. So countries become more democratic, the press becomes more free or less free. Uh, there's more money influencing elections or less money influencing elections and so on. By that count, the United States, which I'm going to say a lot about the United States for two reasons. Uh, the main reason is it's the, it's the model, good, good and bad, for most of the rest of the world. It still is the model for most of the rest of the world. And the second reason, because I'm Canadian, and Canadians get their cakes from putting down there. <laughs> and Rennie is, Rennie is American where we go. Some of my best friends are American. <laughs> um, by, by that count, the United States, the state of democracy in the United States is diminishing. It's diminishing relative to itself previously, and it's diminishing relative to a number of other countries that maintain much more balance. If you, if you uh, ask me which countries sustain balance more than others, I would probably point to Germany, uh, the Scandinavian countries, Canada, which has a quite a right-wing government now, but they haven't done too much damage so far, um, and so on. So, so what I'm going to talk about is, is partly this imbalance that's come about in society, uh, and partly what we can do about it. It's um, a fairly broad agenda in a way. So I, I call this a pamphlet um, because I, in my modesty, I fashion this like a political pamphlet that, that was written for certain revolutions and so on, although I, I'm not in favor of revolution. But, but pamphlets typically are written to change the political, or, or certain kinds of pamphlets, political pamphlets, have been written to change politics. and. Um, and uh, so I call this a pamphlet. I call it an electronic pamphlet because pa many pamphlets were given away for free. Uh, and I'm going to give it away for free on my own website. Uh, I might make it available for, for, for payment on Kindle or whatever. But anybody who wants it will have access to it for free as well. Um, and um, and I, as Rennie said, I started thinking about this so 15 years ago or more. Um, and did all these workshops around the world to get feedback from other people about it. We're doing one here tomorrow. Um, and, then, um, and then drafted a kind of what I'm now calling the overture, or the sort of first pamphlet, or, or sort of an introduction to the whole thing, an overture in the sense of an overture to the opera, sort of playing the themes, uh, the musical themes that you're going to hear later on in the opera. So, so and what I'm going to talk about tonight is that uh, outline. Um, so we talked about that, and I, I just find this amusing. Um, uh, I'll talk about sources of imba uh, imbalance. I'll talk about the basis for balance. I'll talk a little bit about how we regain balance and what we do to regain balance. So that, those are kind of the sections, if you like, of uh, the uh, pamphlet. Um, I think we're, we've been captured by what I call an unholy alliance of economic dogma with corporate entitlement, or I think I prefer the term free enterprises. Um, when enterprises are free, people are not free. Um, we don't want a society of free enterprises, we want a society of free people. And it's not clear that free enterprises make for free people. Now, Adam Smith argued that if the butcher and the brewer and the baker were free in the marketplace, um, that sort of constituted certain economically liberal freedom. Uh, well, look at who the butchers, the brewers, and the bakers are today. They employ tens or hundreds of thousands of people, um, and they're not independent people. The, the, uh, the chief executives of the biggest brewers or biggest bakeries or whatever are drawing huge bonuses and doing all the things that are causing problems to some extent. Although I don't single out those industries particularly, I think if I had to single out industries, it would be the defense industry, the pharmaceutical industry banking industry in the U.S., the big banks in the U.S. But, but there is a kind of an unholy coalition where economics provides the dogma for justifying uh, 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 tremendously powerful corporations on the international stage. Um, 
And economics, the, the ma mainstream economics, uh, argues the case for so-called economic man. Um, markets, are sac markets are sacred. Uh, uh, um, uh, consumption is the most important thing of all. Um, uh, I can't remember the other factors that they were put down, but, uh, but yeah, I'm glad that greed is good. Markets are sacrosanct. Property is sacred. Governments are suspect. That's essentially the model that economics, the mainstream, there are other kinds of economists, but that's the model that mainstream economics promotes today. And it's a model that, uh, that uh, what I like to say about it is that a, as a view of human nature, it's understandable. As the view of human nature, it's nonsense. It's just plain nonsense. I defy any economist to argue that this is all there is to man. Um, you hear the argument sometimes, somebody put it this way, that if you scratch uh, uh, an altruist, you're going to find an ego, an egotist. In other words, we're all selfish uh, under the skin. Um, and my response to that was the economist who said that uh, probably either didn't have a mother or must, <laughs> or must have had an enough, or maybe mother died or must have an awfully nasty mother. Because if you're looking for pure altruism, Motherhood, pardon the expression, it's a good application of motherhood, is, uh, is about as pure as you can get. Um, to say that people are all, uh, to say that people are not fundamentally altruistic is as silly as to say that people are not fundamentally egotistic. We're obviously both. Uh, but a society or a, or a field that, don that, that promotes one to the complete exclusion of the other, just plain nonsense. So the fundamental basis for mainstream economics is nonsense. It's nonsense, it's just plain nonsense. It's not to say there's not good and interesting things coming out of economics. Uh, the fundamental premise based on those four things is just plain nonsense. So you can contrast ego, egoism, I say egoism. egoism I don't know what the difference between egoism and egoism. But anyway, egoism with altruism. Contrast consumption with conservation, property with poverty. Let me say a word about property and poverty. Um, communism taught us that a society without private property can't function. Capitalism, in its current form, is teaching us that a society with hardly anything but private property can't function. We have public property, we have private property, and, and we also have what's called the commons. Uh, which is not property that's public, but it's property that's open to anybody. So in Boston, there's still, it's called the Boston Common, and you have a place called the Common in your hair, I've been told. Uh, the original Boston Common meant that people who owned cow cows, but didn't have their own land, could graze their land on the Boston Common. It's common property. The air is common property, that's only because Margaret Thatcher couldn't figure out a way to privatize it. <laughs> uh, but the air is the air is common property. Yeah, uh, lake frontage or water frontage uh, or ocean frontage in, in many countries is common property. Anybody can walk. On it. So uh, the um, uh, uh, Wikipedia is common property. Uh, anybody can access it. Anybody can even change it. So Wikipedia, the Commons as a form of property is coming back quite quickly. So so we have this contrast. Uh, between property and poverty, markets versus markets. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, today we went to the market on green, what's it called? Green? Anyway, you know where we went. It's another word that somebody can remember. But, but uh, today we went to the market. The market, well, particularly not, not so much in big cities like this, big city, but bigger cities, but, but in small towns, markets are the heart and soul of community. Markets are where people get together, where they meet their friends, they're where they talk, particularly Saturday morning markets, things like that, Sunday morning markets, where they, it's a kind of social, it's a, it's commercial, it's a market, and prices are determined by supply and demand, for sure, um, but it's a market. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a market, and it, it's an economic market, and it's a social market. So today, for example, we were chatting with one person in the market and he was boasting about his cheeses and, and uh, kind of how he grows them himself, how he makes his own cheeses, and, uh, and and talking often, I think somebody was doing that, about recipes, often, yeah, I bought some um, 
kind of pepper so that they get involved. The room was telling me all the different ways that um, that, I, that I could uh, that we could uh, use it in cooking. Um, people take the time to do that because it's a personal relationship. Uh, she had sold me the thing when she was done. She could have said, you know, move on to the next person. Um, you take community out of the markets, which is a, the economic perspective on markets today, which is a stock market or a grain market or whatever. You take community out of markets, you end up with mercenaries. Um, so this contrast is between markets and markets, Co competition and cooperation, externalities and internalities, quantities versus qualities in the. The economic economists measure gross national product in Bhutan. Uh, they have something called gross national happiness. Um, and, um, and if they try and measure it, which they've been doing to some extent, they'll kill it. Um, because what makes gross national happiness so effective is that they don't measure it. They just, they just attend to it. They really believe in it. They have several dimensions. And they look at it, like reforestation and so on. And they, uh, and they really treat it seriously. So the interesting thing is that when I made this list, I was able to find a quote from Adam Smith on every single one of these things on this side, on the, uh, on the altruistic side. I could find quotes from Adam Smith. So the economists have been quoting the butcher, brewer, and baker, which is a paragraph from Adam Smith. But there's far more material that supports the right side of that, of that chart. So, so. So, um, um, do we live in a market society, a market economy, or a corporate society? In other words, to what extent is our market economy, so-called, becoming a corporate society in which corporations are all powerful? Now, if you if you think of if you name all the powerful international agencies. Uh, that are governmental or quasi-governmental or independent. All the powerful ones, I, don't, I can't think of a single exception that's not economic. I'm leaving out the UN as a kind of overarching thing, but there's the, uh, there's the International Monetary Fund, there's the World Bank, there's the Organization for Economic uh, and, uh, and Cooperation, I'm missing some words there. There's Davos, the World Economic Forum. Um, all of these things are economic. Now, when the Europeans were worried about genetically modified foods, um, they, they stopped them coming in. And three countries, unfortunately Canada, the US, and Argentina, uh, took them to the World Trade Organization Court and won the case. What in the world was the, economic, was the World Trade Organization doing determining a health issue? The Europeans weren't stopping on the basis of trade, they were stopping on the basis of health concerns. And the World, even the, the World Trade Association was allowed to uh, rule on that and stop the Europeans from doing that and overrule the European governments. Makes no sense whatsoever. Makes no sense. But that's an indication of the dominance. And particularly, we have no regulation, no real control of corporate activity on the international stage, nothing of consequence. We learned in the 30s that unregulated domestic markets are dangerous. Now we're learning that unregulated international markets are dangerous. But somehow, we never made the connection. Not that we're doing anything about it now. We're not changing it. So, so we're, we're in, I think, a bad uh, situation. So the grand fallacy. Uh, somebody once said an expert is somebody who avoids all the many pitfalls uh, on his or her way to the grand fallacy. <laughs> so the grand fallacy of economics is that a, as a view of human nature, it has merit. As the view of human nature, it's nonsense. Um, so this is the uh, world as we know it. This is the world as you know it, sitting here like this in a long linear line like this from left to right. I guess you didn't sit politically in a sailing. It's not clear whether you're sitting according to what, what you're facing out or how I'm facing you. So you look very right wing over here, but when you look out, you're very left wing. Which, which actually makes my point, in a way. Uh, we've been dominated by this straight line, all because uh, people sat on two sides of the speakers in the French uh, assemblies two centuries ago. Um, uh, and because the ancien regime sat on the right and the communists sat on the left, uh, all our politics has been dominated for more than two centuries by uh, left and right. 
left, right, and center. Um, and and uh, and what happened in the uh, in 1989 is that as the left left collapsed in Eastern Europe, the right took over, uh, as if somehow uh, because communism was bad, therefore capitalism is good. Um, and I should say that I am a huge fan of business. I'm a huge fan of businesses that respect me, that, ex that, that, that offer me interesting products that do wonderfully well uh, in this city. I don't want government to, uh, to supply my restaurant food in Cape Town. And I don't need the, the plural sector to supply. The private sector does marvelously. Um, and it does marvelously in all kinds of things. It does very badly when it becomes exploitative. It becomes badly when companies get big, powerful, buy up their competitors, seek quasi-monopoly positions, and so on. And we'll get kind of into more of that internationally. I think one of the major turning points in all of this happened in this country uh, a number of years ago when your government tried to bring in uh, the antiviral drug, they call it antiviral, the drugs for HIV AIDS from India, uh, and an Indian company, you, most of you all of you know the story, an Indian company was prepared to supply those, which I think was $300 a year, and the pharmaceutical, whoever had the patents on them, were selling for $15,000 a year. So you get an idea of what the markups are, what the, what the um, pricing is uh, on, um, on, on pharmaceutical. We're talking about factor 30 uh, from 300 is it 30? 50, I guess. From, uh, because there's no, uh, virtually no regulation, at least not in the United States, in some countries there is some regulation. But we give monopoly positions to companies, they're called patents, they're monopoly positions, except these are, these are products that are products for life and death. Um, and then we let companies charge what the market will bear, and that's not my phrase, that's business week. That's the American magazine Business Week talking about pharmaceutical companies charging what the market will get. Completely crazy. The pharmaceutical companies would say, well, you know, we need that to do research. Of course, we need money to do research. How much? How much profit do you need to do research? Now, if I asked you what the three most important pharmaceutical advances of the 20th century were, uh, I assume a lot of you, or most of you, would name things like penicillin, um, uh, insulin salt vaccine, for example. They all came out of not-for-profit laboratories. So we're not beholden to the pharmaceutical industry. There are other ways of doing things. So, so, um, so just an example. So this is the way we do things, and everything is uh, communism versus capitalism, democracy the proletariat versus free enterprise, nationalization versus privatization, public versus private. I could go on. I could add to that list ad nauseum. Um, and I say a pox on both those houses. Uh, I'm not uh, a fan of the, of, the, of the dogmatic left. I'm not a fan of the dogmatic right. So does that make me a fan of the center? Uh, the center is facing a very interesting problem these days. Um, it's, it's paralyzed in most countries. In the U.S., you can see it explicitly where, where Obama, you can see Obama came in Someone on the left has been largely paralyzed by the uh, Congress, uh, but you don't need to stay in the United States. You can go country after country after country. In, che in the Czech Republic, they couldn't even get a government for long periods of time because the vote was so evenly split between left and right. And when you do get a government, the power of the private sector is so strong in most so-called democratic countries um, that governments are largely restricted from really making real changes. And the best example of that was in this country a few months ago in Durban, where, where all the great countries, all the great governments of the world got together. What was their result? That in 2015, they're going to come up with a plan. <laughs> the world's getting warmer, and they're going to come up with a plan in 2015. Think about it. Think about it. Um, so governments are, and it, when governments paralyzed, even if it's a left-wing or center government, when it's paralyzed, that's actually a better state for the private sector, or certain, aspects, certain dimensions of the private sector, than, um, than if government was activist. Uh, because when government's paralyzed, basically, markets and 
companies can do roughly what they like, and this is what's been happening in regu with regulation in the United States. So, uh, so I say, okay, let's take this straight line. We can go, you know, I think we can move this whole room around with the walls to take the left. But, but, um, but we take left and right, and we turn them around into a circle or a horseshoe. Um, and then we say it's not a question of extremes, it's a question of three places, three positions. So we have a private sector that's economic, we have a public sector that's political, and we have a plural sector, NGOs, not-for-profits, co-ops, and all that, which is, which is social. Um, and I, and the ba my basic point is that a healthy society, a balanced society, balances those three. So it has a strong and responsible private sector. I am not opposed in any way to the private sector. It's a question of what it does. Uh, and, a, and a respected public sector. It's time we stop putting down the public sector. You get, you get the government you deserve in a way. If you think government is incompetent, then you get incompetent government. Um, because people don't want to work for incompetent government. In the US, you kind of have to apologize to your friends uh, if, you're, if you're a civil servant. In a certain way, and yet I was at a party in, in Virginia, and these guys were going on and on about taxes and high taxes and government is capable, and so on. I kind of stopped them and I said, "You spent your entire career in the military. You're now on military pensions. Who are you kidding? Every penny you're earning is coming from tax money. Every penny you ever earned is coming from tax money. What are you, what are you talking about? It never dawned on them." <laughs> it never does. It's like nature. Well, if you treat government that way, you, you get uh, you get the kind of government you deserve. Uh, there, you know, there are well-known people writing on health care who say, "Well, you can't. Government can't possibly do I mean, it." A well-known book by Michael Porter and somebody else at the Harvard Business School talked about government can't possibly play a major role in health care. The Veterans Administration is a government-owned health care system that's one of the one of the better. Uh, systems in the United States. It's completely gone. I looked up Veterans Administration and the index to their book. There's three references to it. They don't make any connection. Positive. They don't make any connection to this dismissal of government on one hand and the Veterans Administration doing it perfectly fine on the other hand. So we're, we're stuck. This is part of the economic dogma, I think, that just dismisses anything the government does other than, you know, providing military and police. And that kind of thing. So, so balanced society balances those three, uh, uh, and these are just some dimensions: uh, public, private, plural, political, economic, social, governments, markets, communities. Because I think the plural sector is largely about community and the role of community, and the role of people working together, citizenship, leadership, community. I, I personally think leadership is largely, no matter how much people emphasize leadership, no matter how they define it as engaging in everything else, leadership is about individuals, not about communities, not about working together. It, it, I mean, it's about leaders getting other people and themselves to work together, but the word leadership is all tied up with individualism. Whereas the word community ship, which is a word I'm just coined to go with the others, is, is about working in individuals. And I'm not making a case that everything should be community ship, in fact, I'm going to show you in a minute. Look, we have three sets of needs, all of us. We have lots of needs, but three large sets of needs. One's for protection, one's for affiliation, social affiliation, and one's for consumption. And, and markets and the, uh, the private sector provide consumption to a large extent. Governments provide protection. If you had to use one word to describe the role of government, I think it would be protection in all sorts of ways, whether it's a welfare net or policing or military or whatever. And the social sector, the uh, plural sector, is about affiliation. The word self-actualization there comes from a theory by Abraham Maslow, which basically says when you satisfy other needs, then you can self-actualize. You know, if you satisfy all the others, then you can become true to uh, yourself. Um, a few words about the plural sector, as I said. Uh, I think it suffers from bad labeling uh, because we call it uh, NGOs, uh, non-government organizations. Businesses are NGOs. Uh, nobody defines NGOs that way, but businesses are non-government. Uh, we talk about not-for-profits. Government is not-for-profit. Should be. Uh, 
Um, then we, we talk third sector, it's, it's third rate, or an afterthought. I think the key to balance is that sector. Not because it's more important than the other sectors, but because it's less important right now. And balance will come when it's treated equally. So we use the word plural to go with public-private, because if you say public-private civil society, it just doesn't go together. If you say public-private plural, then people start talking about it naturally as a, as a kind of partner with the, with the other uh, sectors. The plural sector organizations tend to be more engaging. Not always. Uh, they, can, they can go off to, but, uh, but they tend to be more engaging because if you're working for a, uh, for a plural sector organization, you're not really like the Red Cross, let's say, or like Greenpeace, or like McGinn University where I teach, uh, which is, uh, uh, organizations in the plural sector are owned in two ways. They're owned by their members, which would be like churches or co-ops, uh, but the members can't buy and sell shares to, to let people accumulate ownership. Or they're owned by nobody. Most of the most important ones, many of the most important organizations in the world are owned by nobody. Nobody owns Greenpeace, nobody owns McGill University, nobody owns Doctors Without Borders, nobody owns uh, 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 Johns Hopkins Hospital. Um, we, but we don't recognize that sector, it's invisible. And yet, a lot of our best and most interesting organizations come there because when doctors are working at Johns Hopkins, they're not working for government. Not, they're not uh, civil servants. They're not working for private companies, so every time the doctor does something good, he's making more money for some charities and that. Uh, they're working for the institution. Uh, so you've got a kind of broader feeling uh, about the, uh, the organization. Um, all three sectors have their own dangers. So I don't want to make the case that the plural sector is the be all and end all and the answer for everything. The, 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 Private sector, at the limit, suffers from crassness. Markets are crass. You know, they don't care whether you're suffering. If pharmaceutical companies are pricing 50 times the cost of a drug, then and people are going to die for want of it. Ha, huh, that's crass. Um, governments are crude. I heard a wonderful story about a guy, 60-year-old guy, who bought a bottle of liquor at O'Hare Airport in Chicago. And they asked to see his uh, a, a, a car you know, one of his identification cards, so they could confirm that he was over 18 years old. <laughs> That's government. Governments can be crude. They just, everybody's got to be treated equally. Uh, markets, markets, can, uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, the plural sector, or plural sector organizations can be closed. Witch hunts in, in, in Pilgrim America, witch hunts came out of communities. Uh, uh, if, if we've got communism here and extreme form of capitalism here, then we've got fascism up there. Fascism is kind of rooted in community to some extent. So any one of the sectors that dominates a society, the Taliban, is a community organization. You know? So you get governments controlling and communism, you've got the U.S. with the private sector controlling, and you've got the Taliban uh, where, the, where you can argue that the plural sector controls. So a healthy society doesn't let any sector dominate, but it, it allows all three sectors. Okay, how do we regain balance? I, I've already mentioned some of these things. We need more respect for the public sector. We need more responsibility in the private sector. We need more recognition of the role of the plural sector. And we also have to look at the redistribution of, uh, of, of activities. Remy's kind of big on, on partnerships between the sectors. We, we talk about PPPs public-private partnerships. We should be talking about PPPPs. We should be talking about public-private plural partnerships. But some of the, you know what the greatest public-private partnership of all time was? What, what Eisenhower as president, when outgoing president of the US called the military-industrial complex. That was a partner, public-private partnership, but it wasn't balanced. Um, and the country created, I don't know, how many nuclear? Right now, the U.S. has enough nuclear weapons to blow up every city on Earth that has more than 100,000 people. It has at least one bomb for every city on Earth that has more than 100,000 people. And they got rid of, what, two-thirds of the weapons? I don't know, it used to be two, three times 
it, it, it wasn't a war. It was nothing to do with with fighting the Russians. It was about putting money into the pockets of defense companies. So, um, so, so, um, you know, redistributing across the sectors. Changing our nature of organizations. I could talk a lot of management stuff, but the most of the time, about our current crisis, uh, in particularly the American crisis, not the European crisis, the American economic crisis, which I think is a management crisis. It's, it's the uh, failure of, of the management of many American corporations. How many? Try this. Any chief executive who accepts to earn 200 to 400 times as much as the workers in his or her own company is not a leader. They are not leaders. People who accept those obscene bonuses as if they are the be-all and end-all of their companies are not leaders. Now go through the Fortune 500 and tell me how many of those chief executives end up being leaders. I think the figure is probably about five. Okay. They're mostly being paid um, in obscene ways that send a signal saying, this company isn't about us, this company is about me. And that's what's been bringing down the American economy. It's not coincidental that every time a company, or almost every time a big company, doesn't meet its financial uh, uh, figures on Wall Street, they suddenly fire 5,000 people. How come those 5,000 people weren't redundant three weeks ago? It was the same chief executive, didn't he notice? <laughs> like, did they suddenly become coincidental the day you issued your financial statements? What does finding 5,000 people do to the sense of community in an organization? What about the 50,000 who are left behind? They're all protecting their rear ends. Figuring I could be next. How do you build a, how do you build a country like that? The American society has been described as tremendously productive. It's another favorite of the American, and, and actually economists all over the world. In Canada, Canada, we're hearing this all the time. America is much more productive than Canada. Canada has to get with it and be as productive as America. The fact that our economy has been doing much better than the American economy for years is irrelevant. We're not productive. <laughs> okay? And what do they mean by productive? They mean exploration. They don't mean exploitation. They mean exploration. Of pup. A, a productive company is a company that uh, uses its workers properly, that buys good machines, that develops its processes to be more efficient. That's terrific. I'm all in favor of that. But that doesn't describe all of American productivity, and maybe not even most of American productivity. A lot of it is about exploitation. I'll give you an example. Imagine a manufacturing company that fires everybody in the factory and ships customer orders from stock. That is productive. That is really productive because the economists measure the labor input for given output. This company is constantly selling and with no labor in the factory. That's really productive. Obviously, until you run out of stock. The American economy is running out of stock. It can no longer build itself on the backs of its workers and middle managers Working less and less and working harder and harder. That's a big part of American productivity. Killing the economy in order to push up stock prices of individual corporations. So, another another example of, of what's uh, of what's going on. Um, there are a number of other things I'm doing, but uh, but let me say that um, who's going to change all this? Like, I think I think we're in so deep right now. I think governments have been so co-opted uh, on the global scale, and you saw it in Durban, um, and you saw it in Copenhagen previously with global warming. I think governments have been so co-opted that I don't hold much hope for government doing much. I'm all in favor of corporate social responsibility, and I think companies that do that seriously are to be applauded. But greening Walmart is not going to stop greening oil oil spill. There's too much exploitation going on so that even the noble things that some companies are doing, and some are in truly win-win situations where they're building uh, windmills and helping to shift energy consumption, and I applaud that, but, but if we waited for that win-win, I call it the win-win wonderland, which is that uh, 
that there are companies doing well by doing good, as they say. Uh, and I applaud that. But that's not going to get us out of this problem. So it falls back, I think, largely on the plural sector, at least for initiation. It falls back on communities that are going to drive change. And, and, and you have wonderful, absolutely wonderful examples of community initiatives. The, the dealing of, it, of the HIV AIDS crisis in Brazil is a wonderful example of how it grew out of the, out of the plural sector, but the public sector kicked in very strongly and challenged the WTO, for example. So it became a partnership, but it was a partnership driven largely by the plural sector. Not exclusively, but largely. Uh, the ethanol initiative in Brazil uh, was, was, uh, was uh, significantly government and the private sector working together, um, but in a very constructive way. So, so um, oh, I thought I had a new slide there, but it's not there. Um, um, so, so yeah, I don't think it's on me. Um, so, I think we have to start rethinking things in, in fairly major ways. We have to think not that the plural sector is the answer to the problems, but that it's got to take its role alongside. I think we've got to have very strong private sector, but we can't let the private sector dominate social life or political life. I, uh, for companies, that, for, for executives of companies, who want to be truly socially responsible, I say start by getting out of my government and your government. Uh, uh, private money has no business uh, in government uh, the, way, uh, the, way it is, the way it's been in the United States. Um, and, and now we've got a situation in the US. Corporations are, are known as persons in the United States um, by law. In law, corporations are persons. They have the right to make political donations. They have the right to free speech. Um, they don't go to jail when they commit crimes. Persons go to jail when they commit crimes. If, if we offer corporations the, the right to be persons, including that if you do something illegal, you will go to jail, which means you can't sell your products for five or 10 years. We can give corporations that right. They want to be persons? Fine. You do it both ways. You do it both ways. You'll be persons. But right now, as a person, a real person, in the United States, I can give so much money on there, but I can give so much money to the government, to, to a political party. If I own 10 corporations, I can give 11 times as much to the, in the political process because every one of my corporate persons can donate money. So ironically, corporations are persons, and persons are human resources. I'm not a human resource. I'm a human being. You want to be a human resource, that's your business. I'm, a, I'm not a human asset, I'm not a human capital, I'm a human being, and I'm a, a real person. And uh, so those are some of the things we've got to change. And if I sound very negative about the private sector or about corporations, let me just say that if I was doing this under communism 30 years ago, and I had the guts in that society, here I can do it, if I had the guts, I would be saying exactly the same thing, except my attack would be totally on the public sector, because that's what was out of balance. And if it was in fascist Germany, it would have been the plural sector, in a sense. And, uh, but now, because capitalism is trying, it's the, uh, it's the private sector, because it's taken a set of balance. So let me stop there. We can uh, go over the questions or the discussion. Or Warren can take from that side. Anthony, how can you not be the first person to ask the first question? Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for your presentation. I still feel that you've left out one very important factor, which is the role of speculative, speculative trading in the futures market. And this was the main cause of the crash of 2008. The CDOs and CSOs and derivatives and people trading in goods which didn't even exist. So how does this fit into this, this, this theory of yours? The other thing is also the disconnect between the world's financial markets and the real markets. The financial markets are 10 times the real markets. 
the people are training in air. And when the money turns back into the air, then we have the problems. Yes. So how does this fit in? Well, I, I, I agree with that completely. And I, I think it's part of the same thing. It's part of the lack of regulation to some extent. There were certain regulations on banking that was, in, that was introduced after the Depression that, that were dropped by, the, by some of the very people who are now uh, in power in the U.S. in, in the Obama administration. So, so, uh, so partly it's a regulation problem. Partly globalization is completely one-sided. It's, uh, it's, it's, there's, there's no, the, 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 the international agencies that should be, should be regulating certain aspects of international trade uh, are instead cheerleaders for almost anything they want to do. So it, it's, it's, it's another example of exactly what I'm talking about, that, uh, that, that, the, um, that the markets, or at least particularly financial markets, but all kinds, are out of control. Whether speculation caused the problem, I would argue that a uh, deeper rooted problem was the mismanagement of companies. We had people discount. You know, there's only two ways to explain how these big banks and insurance companies could put so much into these uh, subprime mortgages. There's only two ways to explain it. One is that they were utterly cynical, and we'll just make a quick buck and get out of there as quick as possible. And the other is that they didn't know what was going on and that their middle managers didn't care what was going on because there had been so much downsizing and pressure on those people and holding their salaries that, you know, you, you know we've got to make, make, our, make our numbers, we buy some of these junk mortgages, we'll get rid of them as quickly as possible and so on. So, so, so I think it, it, it's certainly a, a problem of financial manipulation in some extent. But look, what you've got in Europe now is, is astounding. You've got rating agencies that were totally inept to be polite, corrupt is probably a better word, but totally inept uh, when it came to, uh, to rate corporations as they should have been rated. Totally inept. Uh, and now they're bringing down, helping to bring down the European economy, and not, and not so much the American economy, more the European economy, uh, by changing the ratings of those European countries. And, and what was the latest? I mean, France got down the rating? Crazy. crazy. They're crazy to just left told it. So I agree with you completely. I, I think it's just another another aspect of what I've been talking about. Professor, great, great presentation. I'm just curious to get your perspectives on the emergence of state capitalism. I know Economist has done a lot of coverage in the emergence of state capitalism. Yeah, I know Economist has done a lot of coverage on that last few weeks and, yeah. and just obviously a bit of a hybrid of your thoughts. Uh, what, what are your perspectives on that? Yeah, and I read that. I, I, I read that on the plane coming over here. Actually, that economist piece uh, on that. It, 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 it. Let me say something for developing country. I'm not sure you call that. So that because of developed and a developing country, it's, it's kind of both in a way. And 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 the the pressure on developing countries is to open up their markets and become kind of wide open so that uh, they can build up you know, their, their economies by outside money and outside companies and so on and so forth. No company, no, sorry, no major country in the history of the earth has ever developed by opening up its markets. Not, not the US, which had high tariff barriers when it was developing. Not the UK, not Japan, not Korea. You can't find one. People, when I said this 10 years ago, people just said, yeah, but what about Ireland? And I said, number one, Ireland was a developed country when it threw everything wide open, uh, uh, and, uh, and it was in the EU. Now we don't have to make that argument about Ireland anymore. <laughs> you know, that argument. So, so the, the, the model for development is what I call an outside-in model. Throw, throw yourself open, and all will be well. And, and it never worked for anybody. Nobody ever did. And we're telling countries in Africa and Asia and South America and so on to do it, and it's absolutely, utterly dishonest. And on top of that, we keep our, talking as a Canadian, we keep our agricultural markets closed. So in the U.S., there are the massive subsidies so that American farmers can supply some farm products because of subsidies to their local market cheaper than the poorest Africans can supply those products. It's absolutely unacceptable. The, the second model was the top-down model, that uh, the government planning, government will do it, and Krumah building Big Dam and Ghana and so on and so forth, and that's the way to build them. And that's been discredited because communism is bad, government's bad, mustn't do this anymore. 
And the third model is an autocom indigenous model. It's inside up. You, you built your economy from the inside up by protecting infant industries so they can get on their feet to compete. Uh, you know, you know the, 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 common, the outside in view is what they call the level playing field. We level the playing field. Well, you know what the level playing field is? It's the New York Giants playing against the team, a high school team from Timbuktu. That's the level playing field. It's level already. Right. Um, so, so state capitalism was a way, uh, it's kind of making a bit of a resurgence, but was a way to, um, to uh, give the state a hand in helping to build industry in the U.S. Health industry, they gave, they gave um, not industry just, but they gave free land away to the railroads, for example, and the railroads were being built. So, so um, and, and I'm not an opponent of government corporations. I, I, my first job was with the Canadian National Railways. It was the most uh, innovative railroad in the world at the time. Um, I listened constantly to CBC, which is a government-owned uh, radio. I'm talking radio, particularly it was a government, it's a government-owned radio network. I don't think. I don't know how you rate these. I don't think there's a radio network anywhere in the world that's even close. I can't imagine. It's so good. So I don't start with this prejudice that government ownership is bad. On the other hand, you don't want to see nothing but government ownership. But, but in certain spheres, it makes sense. Hydro-Quebec has become the biggest uh, uh, seller of hydroelectric power in the world. It was a, it was a government. It was, they nationalized the the uh, electrical companies in Quebec and com combine them into something called hydro It's It's well run discussion. So I don't start with that prejudice. It, but it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. So I say, look, if it's about pharmaceutical research, I think the plural sector is, 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 should be, again, significant. If it's about, I don't know, I mean, the, the supplying of a lot of transport or airlines or whatever it is, I think the private sector can do wonders. It can, it can be marvelous. Uh, Apple is a wonderful example of a private sector company. And uh, there's a role for government, too. So I don't take a dogmatic position one way or another. Okay. Uh, professor, thanks for a fascinating um, input. I just wanted to ask about the the, the work that, um, well, George Soros hasn't done it, but he's used a lot of the Austrian philosophers to talk about his open society and the, the stretch between anarchy on one side and, um, um, I guess, autocracy on another. And I think his central complaint really was, was not so much markets, but communism. Um, and I know that as a mega capitalist, he's, he's plowed a lot of money, particularly into Eastern Europe, to keep that society open. Um, and I see a lot of parallels between what you're talking about, but your complaint naturally now is not so much towards communism, but towards uh, private enterprise. How do you see his views stacking up with yours? Well, I, 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 I hear mixed views from him, and I, I've actually met him. And, uh, and, uh, Read, read one, sent him a three page letter about one of his books, which he never uh, responded to. But, um, <laughs> so, um, on one hand, I think he's done some wonderful things. On the other hand, he also believes, or he did in that book, that America will solve the world's problems, and I think he's kidding himself. Um, he's now come out apparently uh, behind, you know, with Buffett about taxation in the United States, and I applaud that too. So. So I think his heart's in the right place. I think he's a bit misguided about some things. Um, and I haven't gotten into enough depth to figure out you know, the nuances of what he's doing that's good and not good. But, but there is some. Um, look, I'm in good company. Uh, uh, I discovered a speech by Sarah Palin. Uh, it, it was written up in a column in the New York Times. But uh, a speech by Sarah Palin where she was ranting about the big companies and the control of the domination of the political process by the big companies. I thought it was Hale and I together. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it's kind of interesting. So, yeah, I think, uh, I think there are thoughtful people who are trying to kind of work it out. My only problem with Soros is, the, uh, is this belief that it's going to come out of America. Yeah, bro. 
I'd just like to know your thoughts on the plural sector and how they can attract the right skills, given that the private sector obviously pays more, etc. It's more prestigious, just to achieve that balance in society. I'd like to hear it, please. Thank you. Well, what better, what better answer than apparently the, uh, the uh, graduates of the Harvard Business School are lining up to go into the plural sector. Um, so maybe that says it, except I can't imagine anything worse. Uh, <laughs> because, because they're trained to lead. They're trained to lead. They're, they come out of Harvard. They used to come out of Harvard saying, you know, I'm ready to run General Motors or whatever, but now they're coming out saying, I'm ready to run Greenpeace. And I kind of say, we well, have to have a little understanding of what Greenpeace is all about. Uh, you have to pay your dues, invest. And, uh, and, and so people coming out saying, I'm so thrilled with the plural sector and I'm going to race into position and show them how to lead. And I'm saying, you know, being trained at the Harvard Business School is not the way to know how to exercise leadership in the plural sector. And George Bush and Mitt Romney were trained at the Harvard Business School. <laughs> so was Jeff Skilling, who went down with Enron. Um, not coincidentally. Not coincidentally, because, because it's, there's a cult of leadership in business schools that basically says, you know, we're training leaders. And I say, you don't train leaders out of context. All these people went through at a young age. They knew nothing about management when they went in. They knew nothing about management when they came out. Because you don't learn management in the school. You learn management. It's a practice. Management is not a science. It's not a profession. It's a practice. You learn it by doing it. Um, and, and then you can come into the University of Cape Town EMBA, which takes people who are seasoned, experienced managers. Then you can do lots with them, because they understand what you're talking about when you talk about management. But 25-year-olds who you know, sold, you know, sold uh, uh, Avon Club, <laughs> what have they sold for two, three years? Doesn't really matter. Um, so, so the key is to uh, is to uh, um, you know train people or help people who already are managers. And in any sector, whether it's business, the person who thinks he can run everything can run nothing. Because management is about context. You've got to know the industry. You've got to know the situation. There are people who are adept at getting into a new industry and learning it enough to be able to do it. But you've got to know context. You've got to know the situation. Um, and uh, so that's why I'm not very keen on young people who think they're ready to go in and run NGOs. If, if they're going in and saying, I really believe in the environment, I'm going to join Greenpeace, I'm going to build up from the ground up, fine. Fine. People run Greenpeace. There's no Greenpeace intimately uh, as any other institution. So, um, so, um, but, but, but to get back to your, your actual question, there's a movement for all sector, and that's what I'm doing with the pamphlet, trying to do with the plan. And, and then you either have outright resistance, you fight the forces, not, not, not physically, but you confront the forces, you confront the, uh, the BPs with their, you know, with, with, uh, with uh, pollution or whatever it is, or, I think, what's much more powerful is you circumvent them. So if you don't like the consumption of oil going on, then you buy an uh, electric car, or you find other, or you, as in Brazil, you produce ethanol to get around uh, the consumption of, of that kind of uh, fuel. So, so there are ways to circumvent rather than confront that I think are much more powerful. And, and we need all, uh, if it's about the environment, we need to convey messages. We need to say, look, you may be uh, cheering for the environment, but driving air conditioned car when it's not that cold. Uh, so look at your own behavior. Every time you dump your garbage down the chute, it's what the economists call externalities. You, you know, the, the, you, you create so you create consequences because it's so convenient. You throw up a bag, you drop it down the chute, it's gone. You don't pay for it. You don't pay for it. You don't pay for pollution. You don't pay for the garbage. Uh, well, it's easy enough. There are places that are doing that now. They're not only helping to recycle, but they're also charging people for garbage. Uh, so there are ways of doing things. But look, when everybody says it's not us, the tar sands, take a Canadian example, the tar sands is one of the filthiest um, production of, of uh, oil in the world. They were on the radio in Canada a little while ago saying, we're only, we're only one half of 1% 
of the world's carbon emissions. I said, oh, terrific, we'll go after the 20%. We'll pick the five organizations around the world that are, that are costing 20%. We'll go find them. Half a percent is a hell of a lot. The airlines, I think, say it's one and a half percent. Everybody thinks not me. Somebody else, you know what? It's you. It's me. It's everybody else in this room. We're all creative. And we can all change it. So, Professor Minsberg, um, firstly, I want to say thank you because I look around me and there are a whole bunch of us who, who would qualify as that um, why not social initiative. So, we have Many of us are in the plural sector and we've been feeling quite lonely and, and um, like orphans. And so thank you for acknowledging us and for validating us and for giving us another kind of... So we're, gonna, we're all tweeting and saying, Henry Minsberg said we're in the right, <laughs> right sector. Get um, but I'm also going to kind of use right. this opportunity um, to say to you, because uh, Warren put out the invitation and I'm a social entrepreneur and I would not, I would not be living up to my identity if I don't use the opportunity to speak to all these people at the same time to say that we are doing something quite amazing in South Africa and I'm hoping that in two years or three years or ten years time we'll come back and keep tracking what we're doing because we are establishing a PPPPP which is a private public plural partnership and we are changing education so we are um, this is an innovation in leadership development or executive development uh, creating opportunities for business leaders to, as part of their executive development, spend their time working with school principals which is, and dealing with the most significant issue facing South Africa, which is education. So we'd love you to know more about that and, and um, thank you for validating all the work we do. Great, I'm happy to know. One of the things I, I always like to say uh, is that um, beware of measurement. I think measurements kill education. Um, because um, if you can quantify, can you quantify the cost of being here tonight? Yeah. What, 20 rand or whatever it is? And, uh, <laughs> and, and a couple of hours wasted, a couple of hours of your time wasted, I guess more than 20, 20 dollars. Um, and a couple of hours of your time either wasted or whatever. You can quantify the cost of being here. Please quantify uh, how much you'll learn here. If you can do that, then you can quantify what a child learns in a classroom. I defy anybody to do that. So, so one of the things that I think has killed education is all this measurement. It's killed a lot of different things. As I said about gross national happiness, as long as they were measuring it, it was working. Because they have these different criteria, like you know, uh, reinforcing the country and, and so on, and they took it seriously. So they did it. Um, as soon as you start measuring, I know they found scorecards that say you can measure everything. I think it's largely a losing game. Because the things that are easily measured drive out the things that are difficult to measure, no matter how hard you try. And the things that are easily measured are the economic things, not the social things. Jake, one last question. Professor, I think everyone would agree in South Africa what we need more than anything are jobs. Um, now, the government's response seems to be massive public works and uh, social grants which aren't sustainable. How do we build um, jobs in a balanced way and rapidly because we, can't, we don't really have time on our side? Yeah, I'm kind of out of my, out of my depth uh, on that kind of question. Um, of course, I tell you, one of the things that always strikes me in a way, uh, let, me get, let, me, uh, let me tell it by story. I, I spent some time on the kibbutz many years ago. And everybody in the kibbutz worked. And there was one guy who was 80 years old. No, nobody got paid because everybody gets paid together on the kibbutz. So you get paid whether you work or not. There was one guy who was 80 years old. And you know what he did? He tended the graves of his friends. That's what he did. You sort of say, why should there be unemployment anywhere? When people are capable and intelligent enough to work, why can't there be mechanisms whereby they work and contribute? There's something perverse in the economic system that enables an unemployment. The economists would say, I'm sure they're many new, was him being terribly naive because we have high tech and the kind of jobs, the quality of jobs, and you can't just waltz into, you know, be an internet, a person working on the internet or, or whatever. Um, but you sort of say, there's needs in society. And it's a question of how we pay people and how we organize. I'm not arguing for one big economy. Uh, but 
but there's got to be ways to do this. There's something I, I haven't understood, and if anybody has, please email me, but I, I haven't understood it, um, why this should be the case. It's something just perverse with the way our system works. I don't know what it is, but maybe one day it should be like. Before we invite you to join us for a drink, I would certainly like to ask Warren just to pass it back to the next week to listen to this talk. We really want to thank you, Henry, not only for uh, the talk tonight, but for uh, Henry's been working with faculty here uh, and meeting different people and kind of making himself quite available during the week to continue to work tomorrow. Uh, so we've really had a lot of great conversations around meeting other people, so we really appreciate it. South Africa, I'm pretty sure he has, based on the number of desserts he had ordered. <laughs>